Hello and welcome to the third English Today Business DVD. In this DVD, you can watch another four episodes of our story on the job, followed by the business skills section, win-win language. We'll then look at the following topics, note-taking and report writing. Different levels of formality. The various grammatical forms we use to talk about the future. And the writing styles used in email communications. Have fun and enjoy your viewing. I've called you in today to bring you up to speed on our new cookbook series. Anne's going to take notes from which we'll then develop a detailed outline of the work in progress and then set the deadlines. So Gary, which authors have we contacted? We've got in touch with Jones, Bradford, Smith, Fox, and Grant. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to contact Tchaikovsky. I think he's abroad at the moment. Cha what? I'm um, sorry. Um, could you spell that for me, please, Gary? Certainly. C-H-A-K-O-S-W-S-K-I. He's one of our Russian collaborators. Couldn't we get in touch with Parker in his place? What do you think? He's worked with us in the past. It's a good idea. Unfortunately, I haven't got his number. I think I have it in my old appointment book. Let me just make a note of that so I don't forget. What's the news on the contribution so far? Have the authors started sending in material? Yes, and uh, I've already begun editing the first batch. Excellent, Anne. You'll also have to take care of researching the images. When you've got those, you can send them along to the graphics department for page insertion. Let's move on to the typography. Rachel, have you seen the first batch of proofs we got from Montex today? Yes, Mr. Stevens. Great work, I must say. It seems to me that they've done an excellent job. Good. So it looks like we can trust them with this edition. Let's get a bid in immediately. Take note of that, Rachel. Yes, Mr. Stevens. I'll call them as soon as we finish this meeting. One last thing. We haven't found a title for this series. Do you have any ideas? Come on. Use your imagination. I want something original. Something catchy. Nothing? Okay, then that's your first task. Do some brainstorming to come up with some ideas, and then we'll go through them together. Why the long faces? There's nothing to worry about. You're a great team. I'm sure you'll think of something interesting. Okay? The purpose of today's meeting is to discuss the Smarting Marketing Campaign. Does anyone have any suggestions? Before we move forward with the planning, I think we need to take into consideration a number of aspects of the campaign. I'm referring to the concept, the objectives, the targets, and the type of media we need to employ. Good observation, Mr. Chang. Getting our ideas clear before we move on to the direction and, and score of our marketing drive is an excellent idea. What do you think, Paul? I'm in complete agreement with you. First, we need to set our objectives for this campaign. We need to decide upon our focal points in terms of brand communication. Could you explain what you've written on the board there? That'll help us understand where you're going with this. Brand awareness rising will help potential clients become familiar with our products and the marketplace we're targeting. In our case, this type of campaign will serve to improve the image of Spectre in the Chinese market. Um, but uh, what about focusing the campaign on the product itself? A product campaign is generally much more focused and serves to meet different objectives. Above all, 
it can help communicate the unique characteristic of the product to help it stand out in its marketplace. Of course, this can eventually bring positive results to the entire line of products. And in your opinion, what type of campaign best suits our needs? Well, considering that the Chinese market is new for us, I choose a campaign focusing on brand awareness with a simple but effective message, such as uh, our company provides sporting goods with a high-tech edge, and then follow up with a successive campaign focusing on the smart team. Are there any comments on Paul's proposal? I'm in complete agreement with him. Great. Would you like to add anything, Paul? Not for the moment. Well, if there are no objections, I'd like to move forward on this. Our next step is to contact a marketing agency. Could you take care of that, Paul? Certainly, Victoria. Well, if there's nothing else, I really need to get going. Oh, my goodness, look at the time. You're always busy, aren't you, Mrs. Lee? I think you work too much. Well, actually, I need to go to my son's school play. I promised him that I wouldn't miss it for anything in the world. Well, then get a move on. Children always come before business. What are we doing now? Let's go for lunch. Good, so there you saw two different meetings. And now let's talk about report writing after meetings because it is important. You have to keep a record of things that happen in meetings. But it's not easy and people are usually very bored with writing reports. So I want to try and give you a few tips of how to improve your report writing. So let's use the screen. Now, obviously, the first thing is you have to identify the speakers, know exactly who is in the meeting and what their position or job is. Now, the second thing is to write brief summaries of the main points. Now, it's important to keep these brief. For example, Victoria's meeting. Let's think about that. Can you remember the content of that meeting? Well, we could say that the main points were, number one, brainstorming on the Smarty marketing campaign. That was the general activity at the beginning. So the first thing was brainstorming on the Smarty marketing campaign. Then the next important thing was setting objectives for the future steps. The third thing they talked about was the brand awareness of the campaign for China. That's the third most important thing. And then after the future plan was contacting the marketing agency. So from that meeting, there were four main points to be recorded. Now, try to remember to keep your notes concise so that people can read them quickly. You don't want to have to read pages and pages of reports. There's no time. All right, keep it concise. Then try to highlight, and this is very important, highlight the decisions made and the conclusions, because that's more important than saying what has been said. We want to know the conclusions. We want to know the decisions taking. And another uh, important thing, probably the most important thing, is the action that is going to have to be taken in the future. So what are the actions to be taken, all right? Then, immediately after the meeting, try and write up your notes as soon as possible because otherwise you tend to forget, all right? So as soon as possible. Fantastic. Now, how do we organize the report? What's the layout like? Well, it's really quite simple. You have an introduction where you state the relevant old business and also the new business. So that could be your introduction. Then in the main part, you specify the main discussion points of the meeting, as we mentioned before. And then in the conclusion, in the summary, you talk about the decisions and about the actions. So that would be an efficient report not too long, the most important decisions, the most important conclusions and actions for the future. All right. 
Now, often in reports, we abbreviate language to make, again, the report shorter. And I want to look at some of those common abbreviations with you now. Look at the screen. E.G. means, for example. I.E. means, that is. E.T.C., very common, is etc. C.F., C.F. means compare. C or C.A. means about or approximately. N.B. means note, take note of this. Approx, approximately. D.E.P.T. is department. X, which is E-X-C-L, means excluding. M-I-M-P dot is important. I-N-C-L means including. L-T-D is limited, often to describe companies. N-O is number. P or P-P is page or pages. Probs, P-O-R-B-S, probs, problems. R-E, with reference to or concerning. R-E-F is reference, just reference. V dot is very, and S stroke T is something. Now, these are very, very common abbreviations, and you can use them freely in your reports. It shortens the task. All right, so remember, when you're writing reports, keep it short, keep it concise and to the point. Concentrate on the decisions taken, the conclusions, and the plans uh, for future actions. All right? Well, thank you very much, and we'll meet again in the next lesson. Bye. Hello and welcome back to Business Talk. Our topic for the next two programs is win-win language. The language that allows all parties of a conversation to feel like winners, whether the conversation is business related or not. Eric and I will be demonstrating how the use of win-win language in an argument, a negotiation or even an informal chat can ensure that both speakers involved come away satisfied. Today we'll be focusing on the language of argument. And next time, we'll look at the language of negotiation and small talk. So, how can we present an argument in the best possible way? Win-win language is the answer. When you make a business proposal or a request, you win your case. And this is the important part. You make the other party feel that they've won too. You both win. Hence the name win-win. Now, listen to Lucy carefully asking for an increase in an advertising budget. Afterwards, we'll consider if we'd accept a request or not. Well, as you know, our new product, Smarty, is not selling as well as expected. I don't think it's possible to solve this problem without spending more on advertising. If you'd accepted my original proposals, things probably wouldn't be so bad. I think the product is good, but if you don't increase my advertising budget, there's no way that Smarty will be successful. I'm asking for an increase of at least 15%. If I'd had this money last year, I could have organized a much more effective campaign. I can't produce great results without the necessary resources. Well, I think we can safely say that that's not what we mean by win-win language. I know I'd be reluctant to agree to a request presented that way. Well, you'd be absolutely right, because I didn't mention any of the benefits of my proposal. I didn't use any facts to support my case, and my attitude was very negative. I said what I didn't want, rather than what I did want. Okay. Now, listen to me present the same request. Good morning, everyone. This morning, I'd like to propose an increase in our advertising budget of at least 15%. This may seem a lot, but there are two good reasons why we should agree that this increase is necessary. Let me try to explain as simply as possible. First, our new product, Smarty, as we all know, is vital for the survival of our company. It is therefore essential to give Smarty the very best advertising campaign that we can. What's more, we should do all that we can to ensure that Smarty is not just a success, but a real market leader.
The second reason is that with a bigger budget, we'll be able to create the sort of market image that our company needs if we are to survive in a world of global competition. Let's try to imagine a campaign where we can really enter the minds of ordinary people. Let's suppose, for example, that we invested a series of full-page color ads in the three major weeklies of the largest countries where we sell Smarty. Imagine the positive impact this will have on the sales of all our products. And I'm sure you'll agree that it's most definitely worth a try. That's what I call win-win language. Well organized, emphasizing a team spirit and the benefits of the proposal. Well, yes, I'm sure we'll all agree that my chances of getting that budget increase are definitely higher than yours. Well, that's all from us for now, so see you soon. Bye-bye. Now, let's take a closer look at exactly why my request was more convincing than Lucy's. Well, if we consider the three fundamental points that are the basis of all communication strategies, simplicity, organization, and language, and look back at our presentations, we can clearly see that Lucy hadn't organized what she wanted to say. She didn't mark each point clearly, and she created a barrier between herself and her listeners with her repeated use of I and you. Here are just a few examples from Lucy's request. I don't think it's possible. If you'd accepted my original proposals, if you don't increase my advertising budget, there is no way that I'm asking for, I can't produce great results without, Remember team spirit? Well, it's very important in win-win language because if you and the person you're speaking to are on different teams, it means there will be a winner and a loser. And a loser could be you. Notice also how Lucy's attitude and language are very negative. If we look at my budget increase request, we'll see a very different approach. First of all, I presented my case in a logical way. People react positively to ideas that are well organized. I marked each point clearly with opening sentences like, let me try to explain. First, it is therefore essential to, what's more we should, the second reason is that we will be able to, let's try to imagine a campaign where we can, Let's suppose, for example, that we invest in. These opening structures are very useful. They organize your presentation logically and therefore make it clear and simple to understand. Notice, too, how the use of we and are make a huge difference. It puts the speaker and the listener in the same team and makes it possible for both to be winners, as well as organization, simplicity, and language. Here are a few argument strategies to help you win your case. Present your proposal in a logical way. Emphasize the benefits of your proposal. Choose two or three strong arguments. Too many reasons can weaken your case. Be positive. Say what you want, not what you don't want. Use facts and figures to support your request. Mr. Chang, can you hear clearly? Yes, yes, I can. Go ahead. OK, then let's begin. So, Paul, how's the marketing campaign coming along? We're putting together a complex communication strategy that's going to leverage different channels, from TV spots and radio jingles to magazine runs and banner advertising on the Internet. The Internet? Are you sure that'll bring about results? Absolutely, Victoria. The Internet has enormous potential. Web marketing is direct and allows for niche advertising that builds better rapport with our clients. Isn't that right, Mr. Chang? Yes, even if it's true that not all Chinese families have a broadband connection like you do here in the West. The Internet is still very popular in China, especially with the young. Internet cafes of all sorts are opening across the country. And uh, according to the Chinese Information Technology Ministry, the number of avid Internet users has already reached 120 million. Wow, I had no idea there was such a boom in information technology. Oh, yes. 
technology has become the determining factor in the economic and cultural development of the contemporary Chinese society. Above all, it's young adults who are influenced by these new communication media. 60% of web servers in China are between the ages of uh, 18 and 26. Words such as uh, forum, uh, blog, uh, email, and chat have uh, become part of their everyday speech. I think we need to focus uh, our efforts in this arena to successfully market our products. As a matter of fact, not only am I working to develop a graphically attractive site with plenty of content, but I am also contacting major internet portals to post animated banners. I am also looking into other means of reaching a much more clearly defined niche by target advertising through news groups, mailing lists, chat rooms and forums. I'm even thinking of launching a viral marketing campaign. A viral what? Sounds like a disease to me. Viral marketing is a marketing strategy that induces users of certain internet sites to promote products to other surfers like a virus. In this way, exponential visibility of our message is possible. It's like a word of mouth on steroids. If we succeed, it's a low-cost communication strategy that has an extremely attractive growth potential that's hard to calculate. Pure genius. I must say, Paul, you're the tops when it comes to technology. Well, considering I spend so much time chatting, don't tell me that you prefer friends made in uh, virtual space. Well, to be truthful, I found my fiancé on the internet. Gary, did you get that email problem fixed? Yes, I did. Uh, I set up a new account for you. You only have to create a new username and password. How do I do that? I'm hopeless with computers. I know you are. In fact, uh, by now I've lost all hope with you. <laughs> but you really do need to try to learn. I mean, uh, email and internet are indispensable in this day and age. I know, I know, Gary. You don't ever get tired of repeating that. I must admit, I'm a Luddite. How I miss the days when you wrote letters by hand and visited the library to do research. <sighs> Everything's changed now. I think I've done well to learn to send and receive emails. Speaking of emails, um, I noticed what you were writing to the authors, and if you'll permit me, Rachel, your emails are much too stuffy and formal. They don't fit in at all with Internet jargon. What are you saying? I'll give you an example. Uh, when you start uh, off an email, uh, you use... We'd like to inform you that. Uh, it's quite old-fashioned, you know? Uh, it's better to write, did you know that? Or another example, uh, when you need to make an excuse, you begin, we regret to inform you that. It's much better to use something like, uh, unfortunately, we can't. It's less formal, but at the same time, more professional. Email needs to be kept simple and to the point. Use abbreviations as often as possible, and keep phrases short. If you're writing to someone you know well, you can even add an emoticon. It's always a pleasure to get one. An emoticon? What the devil is that? <laughs> <laughs> you're so old school, Rachel. Emoticons are those little faces that you can make using keyboard characters that show how you're feeling at the time. Okay, okay, Professor. I'll try to simplify and use a more colloquial tone when writing. Mm. Perhaps I'll even put in a smiley. It's not difficult. You'll see. Just let the magic of the internet transport you. But uh, remember to use netiquette. You're talking like a computer manual. What is netiquette? It's good manners on the internet. It's the rules of the road of the network. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. You really do need to get some practice, don't you? <laughs> I've got an idea. Why don't you let me sign you up for a forum? That way you can learn the rules of the road and the lingo as you surf. Speaking of which, uh, do you like music? Huh? Music? 
Yes, very much so. Great. Then I'll add podcasting sites to your favorites. So you can download podcasts and maybe even burn them to disc. And Stop. <laughs> Gary, oh, you're driving me crazy. I don't understand a word. Besides email, I have no desire to learn any of it. None of it. Do you understand? <sighs> Good. Now, before talking about email writing, I want to talk about another concept which we've already looked at before. It's when we use formal and informal language in English, because often you have to choose, and it depends on certain factors in the conversation. So let's look at the screen now to help us with that. Now, one of the first important things to remember when you're choosing either formal or informal language is the function. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, what is the purpose of the conversation? Because if you are asking your boss for a favor, now that's quite a tricky situation, so you need formal language. But if you are asking a colleague or a friend for help or assistance, then that's a more informal situation, so you need informal language okay that's the first thing the function and then also the domain that means what is my position in the conversation what is my role what are my rights and responsibilities because again if I am speaking to my boss then my language will tend to be more formal if I'm speaking to a subordinate that my language will then tend to be more informal all right, but let's look at some examples for you to understand better. Now, the first one is, look at this. Excuse me, do you think it would be possible for me to have a day off next week? Now, do you think it would be possible? That is obviously high register formal language. And the situation is a subordinate asking their boss, do you think it would be possible? The next example is, Tom, could you give me a hand? Now, you can see, could you, it's less elaborate language, it's informal, it's probably a situation between two colleagues, so that's informal. What about the next one? Peter, hurry up with that report. That's interesting because hurry up is an imperative, it's asking for specific action, so in this case, it's probably a boss talking to his or her subordinate, okay? So, formal, informal. And in the second scene, where there was Gary and Rachel, Gary was trying to make Rachel use less formal language. And in fact, the examples were these. She wrote initially, we'd like to inform you that. Now, that's very formal in English. He suggested this. He said, no, use informal, say this. Did you know that? Look at the difference. We'd like to inform you that, or did you know that? The other example that he drew to our attention was, she said, I regret to inform you that. Regret is a very formal verb. I regret to inform you that. He said, no, no, use unfortunately. Unfortunately, we can't. So that's very interesting, and we will look at that more closely in another lesson to help you when you're in the process of writing emails. But one more important thing, when you're dictating email addresses, you need to know how to say the punctuation of emails. So let's look at that list now together. The first one, underscore, dash or hyphen. Next. Colon, semicolon, full stop, dots, comma, apostrophe, slash, double slash, at, brackets, speech marks, question mark, and exclamation mark. All right, so learn those and practice them. They're very important from where you for when you're giving or you're taking email addresses. Good. That's all about emails for now, but we'll come back to it in another lesson. Okay, bye.
Hi, Victoria. Hi, Paul. Paul, what's the matter? You look awful. What? Haven't you heard? You know I've been away for four days. My boy was sick and the babysitter went to visit her mum. Did something happen while I was away? Only a disaster, Victoria. Total disaster. You're frightening me, Paul. Just calm down and tell me what's happened. Spectre has been bought by a Japanese multinational. Mrs. Frost has been fired. And Mr. Chang has been transferred to Atlanta, where he'll be in charge of a men's clothing department. What? Come on, Paul, you've got to be joking. I'm afraid not, Victoria. And there's more. You've been taken off the project. You're no longer in charge of the Smarty project. The headquarters have called in a marketing manager from Harvard. You'll be her assistant. And I don't envy your position at all. I spoke to her on the phone earlier, and she didn't seem to be friendly, to say the least. You know the type, Mr. Noito. As a matter of fact, she's just sent this fax with her analysis of the sporting goods market and with a few of her tactics. The fax is entitled, Study this truly before my arrival. Oh my God, but why? Things weren't perfect. Spectre was having trouble, certainly, but they were indicative of a crisis that is being felt throughout the sector. In fact, that's why we launched the Smarty campaign targeting the Chinese market. We were trying to create some momentum, new opportunities. Things weren't going badly. To start with, no. But then, the current negative trends were felt in this area as well. Low salaries were eroding consumer confidence, forcing us to raise prices to keep profits up. Add to that the competition that literally beat us over the head. It's very difficult to compete in a market where raw materials and labour costs are so low. The final result was an excellent, high-quality product that was priced out of the market, which prevented us from competing. I know, I know, but we were creating a niche market for ourselves. Yes, but the revenues were too marginal. In any case, we'll get the details at the meeting this afternoon. Mrs Frost and Mr Chang will be there. And possibly even our new boss, Helen Collins. Speaking of which, here is her outline. Make sure you study it well. As you know, we're dealing with a very difficult situation at the moment. On the one hand, our revenues are sinking due to price battles with our competition and the fact that consumer demand continues to decrease. On the other hand, our internal costs continue to rise. The result is a significant fall in profits which has forced us to sell out to a Japanese multinational. It's not a pretty picture. Couldn't we have considered corporate overhaul? Anything would have been better than this drastic solution. Improving company efficiency calls for massive investments that we are just not in a position to make. And with our books in the red, we couldn't move forward with these investments, not to mention the personnel cuts we would have had to endure. Believe me, Mrs. Lee, before we went ahead with the sales of Spectre to the Makiko Group, we took a number of other solutions into consideration. Unfortunately, none of these provided the answer. And what about the Makiko Group? How do they intend to resolve this current crisis? Makiko has already reorganized a number of firms in the past and therefore possesses the appropriate know-how. I do know that they plan to put a major restructuring of the company into action from A to Z, corporate workflow and bookkeeping, management, sales and logistics, to name a few. Above and beyond that, they intend to introduce new direct marketing techniques to improve consumer satisfaction 
and improve corporate visibility in the marketplace. And how? What is the winning strategy? I don't know exactly, but I believe they want to create incentives through promotional strategies. They intend to participate in the largest trade fairs in the sector, open a franchising chain of brand name shops, as well as factory outlets for wholesale. And what do they intend to do with the Smarty campaign? I think, Mrs. Lee, you've already been informed that you will no longer be in charge of that campaign. From that point on, you will be working with Mrs. Collins. Collins is a marketing manager that headquarters has chosen to send here to take charge of the Smarty account as well as other products. As you know, after the initial sales success of Smarty on the Chinese market, sales fell well below our expectations. As far as I know, Mrs. Collins intends to analyze exactly what went wrong and then relaunch the campaign using traditional market techniques. And these will include market research, telephone surveys, bots, etc. In any case, she will soon be here to explain everything in more detail. She should be arriving any moment, actually. Oh, she is. May I introduce Mrs. Collins, the new marketing manager for Spectre? Mrs. Collins, this is Let's your... Let's not waste time with these introductions. We've got plenty of time for that later. I'd like to get down to brass tacks now. Have you all studied my outline? Well, that was pretty dramatic news, wasn't it? Big changes for the future. And in fact, that's what I want to look at right now with you, the future and the different ways of expressing the future. Let's call on the screen to help us do that. Now, a lot of people think that in English, to describe the future, we use will. Well, that's true up to a point, but there are many other ways of expressing the future, depending on the type of possibility in the future that you want to talk about. So let's look at the examples. If you think that something could happen 40%, the possibility is 40%, you wouldn't use will. You would use these verbs. You could say, for example, this could, this may, or this might happen. Or this could, may, might not, the negative, create a problem. You see, these verbs here, could, may, and might, express 40% possibility of something happening in the future. Okay? Let's increase the possibility to 80%, and we need to change the verb. So the example would be, this shouldn't create a problem. So should expresses more 80% of possibility. Now, there's another very interesting way of expressing this 80% of possibility. Maybe you don't know it. It's this. This is likely to create a problem. Now, likely means probable. So, this is likely to create a problem. The verb to be plus likely. Now, if it's a negative form, we would say this is unlikely to create a problem, all right? Important, you'll hear it a lot, describing future possibility. Then if you want to make a very strong prediction for the future, so we're talking about 100% possibility, that's when we use will because we related to a strong prediction. And the examples are, this will create a problem. The negative would be, no, this won't particularly create a problem. Okay, this will and this won't create a problem. And in fact, in the video episode that we heard, the example that Paul said was, you'll be working with Mr. Mrs. Frost. That's what he said to Victoria. You'll be working with Mrs. Frost because that's a strong prediction. All right, so that's interesting. Different ways of expressing future possibility. Could, 
may might, 40%, should, likely, unlikely to, 80%, and then will for 100% prediction. Okay? So, that's all we have to say for the time being on the future. Remember, different ways of expressing the future. Okay, that's the end of this lesson, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next one. Bye. Okay, sweetheart. And remember, do all your homework, and then you can watch those cartoons you like so much on TV. I better get going then. Okay, bye. You do know, don't you, Mrs. Lee, that personal calls are not allowed during working hours? It was just a short call, Mrs. Collins. I was just checking in on my son. Don't you have any children? I do not. I don't care for children. Now let's get back to work. We've already wasted too much time with the small talk. Mrs. Lee, from now on, you'll be in charge of all the email correspondence we receive from our website. Keep in mind that I expect satisfactory replies. Specifically, do not try to argue with anyone. Just come up with results. Invent something. We have to win our customers' trust. They have to know we can satisfy any desire they may have. Even if we can't. But, Mrs. Collins, I've never been responsible for responding to clients' emails. Our personnel and customer service usually take care of that. I don't care how things were done in the past. Today we're off to a new start, and you'll take care of the tasks that I assign you. Have I made myself perfectly clear? I do not like to be challenged. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Lee, speaking of email, you'll soon be receiving your work schedule for next week. Goodbye. So, this client who just purchased a pair of outdoor shoes would like to receive a Spectre catalogue. Dear client, first of all, congratulations on your purchase. In exchange, would it be possible for you to spend five minutes at our company website completing a customer satisfaction survey? Please do not hesitate to contact us with any questions you may have concerning our product. Yours sincerely. I think that works. Who would have ever thought I'd end up doing a job like this? Now that that spiteful woman has arrived to order me around, I'm tempted to give it all up. I wish I had a more creative position. Writing, now that's my true passion in life. Ah, an email from Mrs. Collins. Mrs. Lee, attached you will find your work schedule for next week. Don't forget to keep this in mind at all times. I do not want any more time wasting. <laughs> She manages to be a royal pain even when writing an email. I don't think I'm going to hold up for much longer. Another email? What the hell does she want this time? Ah, oh, no, it's from Mr Chang. Dear Victoria, before leaving, I wanted to send my regards. I'm truly sorry that things have gone so terribly wrong. We worked very well together and I highly appreciate the mutual respect we had for one another. I know that between you and Mrs. Collins, there's no loss of love. You'll have to believe me when I say that I find her highly unlikable as well. <laughs> Stiff upper lip. <laughs> You're an asset to this company and I'm sure you'll do very well. It's been a great pleasure knowing you and please keep in touch. Let me give you one last piece of advice. In China, when we are sad or angry, we have a way of relaxing which always works. We close our eyes and have a good laugh. Try it and you'll see that it works. Ah, oh, Mr Chang, I'm going to miss you. He really was a nice person to have around. Let's try his method. <sighs> Mrs 
Mrs. Lee, what are you doing? Is this how you work? Emails, emails, emails. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Because when you're writing emails, you need the flexibility to be able to move from a formal style of writing to an informal style of writing. Because if you're writing, for example, to new customers, new contacts, to your superiors, where there's a distant relationship, then you need to use formal language. If you're talking to colleagues and friends with people with whom you have a well-established relationship, then you can use informal language. But you need to be able to move from one to the other with ease. And it's not so simple. So I'd like to give you some examples of differences between formal and informal ex expressions that we very often use in emails. Let's look at the screen to help us with this. Now, look at this example here. Very often we might begin an email in a formal way with this phrase. Further to your email of the 7th of July. Notice, further to your email. Now that's formal. How would we say that informally? Well, we would just write re your email of. Re, R-E your email of. That's the informal way. Now, you try and guess every time the informal way, I will give you the formal way, okay? I apologize for not answering, but you see that's very formal. I apologize for not answering the gerund, but what's the way of saying that in an informal situation? Yeah, you could say just simply, sorry I didn't answer, but. All right? Sorry I didn't answer, but. Next one. I'm writing with regard to the invoice of blah, blah, blah. I'm writing with regard to. How can you make that informal? Okay, we could say something like just a note about. Invoice 7, for example. Just a note about. That's informal. Next one. I'm delighted to tell you that we won, for example, the business. I'm delighted to tell you is formal. Informal? You could say just simply, good news. We won the contract. All right? Good news. Next one. Again, very, very formal. I regret to inform you that we... Mm, I regret to inform you that. In, that's a formal verb, regret. What can you say informally? Just simply, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we lost the business. Okay, so you can see the difference. Very often, the informal is much shorter and more concise and more familiar, obviously. Next one. Please find attached, now that's when you're sending documents, the formal way usually is, please find attached documents, blah, 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 blah. Informally, yes, you could say, I've attached the following documents, blah, 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 blah. All right, next one. I'd be grateful if you could, now here are three Typically, formal expressions that we use very often in emails. Listen to these. I'd be grateful if you could. I wonder if you could. I wonder means uh, it's a thinking process. Um, do you think you could? Now, English is full of very polite language, and that's an example. How can you make those less formal? Yeah, simply by saying... Please could you, or please can you, right? Next one. Do not hesitate to contact me should you need any further information. Now, that is a classic phrase that we use in emails. Do not hesitate to contact me should you need any further information. It's formal. How do you make it informal? 
Well, we could say, let me know if you need anything else. Quite simply, let me know if you need anything else. All right? Next one. At the end, often, of emails, you could say, I'll inform you on any developments. I'll inform you on any developments. Let's make that informal. We can say, I'll keep you posted. I'll keep you posted, which is an unusual expression. To keep someone posted, you need to learn it by heart, okay? And the last one, again, is a classic phrase. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Informally could be just see you soon. Best wishes. All right, good. So I hope that helps you be able to expand your repertoire of formal and informal language because it's important for you to give the right impression when you're writing. Good. So that's all for now about emails and see you again in the next lesson. Bye.